Hello there, this is Nanto Gias here with a new series. On finishing Claymore and having it be one of my favorite manga series recently, I thought, why not make some videos on it, since there aren't too many dedicated videos on the series. While I could make one on the 7 ghosts, I find the abyssal ones more interesting to talk about. They are some of my favorite characters and have some of the best designs, period. So here are my thoughts on each of the abyssals in the series. Now, who counts as an abyssal? While most of the entries here are clear-cut, there are also a few contentious characters. I will be going more in-depth on why I included them in their parts, but here's the general guideline. A warrior considered number one who has awakened. So as long as they have been compared to a number one or held the position, they count. Also, the beyond officials do not count as they can each have their own dedicated video. Now, let's get started. Rifu is the first abyssal we get to meet and it's a great introduction to them. Plus, she's probably my favorite with the best gaming chair. At the point when she was introduced, we've already gotten used to awakened beings, and they aren't that big of a threat to Claire anymore. After all, she just beat an awakened Ophelia all on her own. However, this does get put into question once we actually see her. She gets introduced alongside Dolph in a Nappa and Vegeta fashion, with the large of Dolph carrying out her orders without question, implying that she is far above him in power. Her calculated sadism with turning captured warriors into awakened ones also distinguishes her as an enemy. Throughout the battle with Dolph, it's made clear that she is the one controlling the battle and that it will end the moment she stops playing around. In fact, Rifo's playful personality is something I really enjoyed seeing, as it contrasts and complements her scheming nature throughout the story. Also, her relationship with Dolph is really interesting. On first impression, it seems to be a very toxic relationship, and it is, but during the fight with Elisa, we get to see her so genuine concern for him dragging him away despite being extremely weakened at this point. And her death is also poetic, as the end result of her scheming and overconfidence. Whilst I prefer her human form since it is more expressive, her awakened form has a certain charm to it due to its basic design and powers, which gives her a lot of flexibility in terms of fighting and allows for some amazing thoughts and moments. And to briefly touch on her final appearance, the payoff was well worth it as the fight between her and Priscilla is one of the best in the series. But she's not considered an official one at this point, or even her, and we have more to cover so I'll leave it at that. Ithli is a very interesting character from the beginning. He was first mentioned by Riful as the one to defeat Priscilla and built up as someone more cruel than her. When I first read Claymore, I took Riful's words at face value, but I was expecting Priscilla to backstab him after accomplishing his goals. However, what actually happened made Easley into a fantastic character that I wasn't expecting to love at the end. His introduction was a step up from Refuel's as now we have the knowledge of what an abyssal is. So seeing Rocky make contact with Priscilla and what seems to be her boss was extremely tense. Which made it a pleasant surprise when we find out that he's pretty chill. He even trains Rocky from Virgin to Chad and takes him and Priscilla to the south. Isley undergoes the most character growth out of all the abyssals, even if it was all off screen. Going from a very calculating tactician to basically a father to both Rocky and Priscilla, who even when dying thought of the time they had spent together. In essence, he was like the male version of Teresa, both being far above everyone else in that time, even the number two with Isley being the only male warrior to voluntarily awaken. And both of them were also ultimately defeated due to their softness, as Isley probably wouldn't have died if he were more focused on building back up his forces while having Priscilla at his side when the Eaters arrived. Isley's awakening design also stands as one of the best in the series, a giant armored centaur able to turn his arms into weapons which also subtly shows off his power as it has been established that firing off one's body requires a lot of yoki. Oh, and he gets to appear in two of the one-offs to make up for his lack of screen time compared to Refull, which I welcome. And speaking of lack of screen time, Luciella appears, has a fight we don't see a lot of, and then she dies. Luciella's design in both her human and abyssal forms are good but doesn't really stand out even among awakened ones with her mouth gimmick not being too interesting. Her relationship with Rafaela is also not really explored in detail, 
They have two scenes with each other, one where they separate and another where they reunite. In fact, both of them are just victims of lack of screen time, with Raffaella working slightly better as she uses her lack of screen time to create an aura of mystery in her first few appearances. Other than that, they aren't too interesting since we see them only at the end of our character arcs. Which is pretty apparent since I'm talking about her sister rather than Luciella herself. Moving on, we have Alicia and Beth, the successful attempt at creating an official one. It is rather sad that the two mostly emotionless drones are more interesting than Luciella and Raffaella. Alicia was first introduced after the meeting with Riffle, where it was made clear that she was far different from the other Claymores due to how the organization was talking about augmenting her further. And we get to see her and Beth take on the same group of Awakened Ones that had previously defeated Claire and the other Claymores, with both of them effortlessly clearing them. Interestingly enough, according to the data books, both Alisa and Beth have the exact same stats. And if we go by how Alisa can also control Beth while she was infected by the unnamed Rafaela and Luciella fusion, the two twins afterwards and even Sophia and Noel, it can be assumed that both of them have the same claim to being number one. However, this may just be speculation on my part. Alicia has one of my favorite designs in the series. It has a really sleek design which makes it stand out from the heavier or more animal-like awakened designs. Also, she's a mother flipping bow reference. Rosemary is kind of contentious for being an abyssal since she was the number one for only a bit and was easily defeated. But considering that both were due to Teresa, who is basically the Ken Party of Claymore, I wouldn't consider those as an anti feat against her abyssal status. The main purpose of the chapter anyway was to show off how strong Teresa is since she only went up against other claymores in the series. Her abyssal form looks good but it's not really one that I remember. I'm not as strict with her as Luciella as she serves her plot purpose pretty well. Hysteria is first up for the revived number ones and she's pretty cool. The number one before Rosemary acts as the ditto match for Miria, as well as a parallel to the Rigaldo fight, and man was it a good fight. I really like her design pre-awakening. It's a really cool and pretty appearance that I think is pretty underrated. Her abyssal form is also pretty fantastic as just this spider with wings that calls back to class awakened form. She's the second speed-based opponent for Melia, where even pre-awakened she could utterly blitz her. She really seals the deal that abyssals are still well beyond our protagonist, requiring massive teamwork and planning to even defeat. And she's not even the strongest one here. Her sadism as she plays with the claymores and even the ghosts is really entertaining. I also enjoyed how she slowly breaks down throughout the fight with Miria and gets more unhinged as Miria keeps up with her which ultimately made Miria's victory at the end all the more cathartic. Cassandra the Dust Eater is likely to be who most people consider as the strongest abyssal, and with good reason. Her pre-awakening design is pretty plain compared to the other two she was introduced with, and she doesn't have a big moment in her introduction like blitzing Miria or retaining all her memories of her past life, but once she awakens, she becomes a lot better. I like her more humanoid awakening design and her head tentacle things. Her half-human part also really helps with her characterization through being more expressive than most awakened beings. And in terms of character, I really enjoyed her domineering personality whenever she takes control of a battle. Just seeing her calmly chew up the awakened beings while they are getting destroyed is really cool, and while I think the literal shit-talking in her fight with Roxanne became too over the top, it is very cathartic to see her get so much joy from finally taking out her anger on Roxanne. I also liked how she died in a peaceful way at the hands of Teresa, in contrast to how she originally died. Roxanne is one of the few irredeemable major antagonists in Claymore, and I love her for that. The way she just revels in her sadism is on a whole nother level compared to Ophelia. Even though her whole character mainly serves as a catalyst for Cassandra's, Roxanne kind of steals the soul out of the three abyssals. She was immediately the most intriguing one due to her retaining her memories, and we can immediately jump into her character. Her design is also fantastic and allowed for a lot of great panels which perfectly shows off her emotions, especially her crazed ones. I felt that we kind of lost this interesting aspect when she awakened, which is a good design but doesn't help to convey her personality like Cassandra's. 
Roxanne's backstory is also really good, where it mainly serves to showcase how psychotic she was due to the creepiness of her taking the styles of the other claymores. And I like how it connects to Cassandra's backstory and how Roxanne plotted to steal Cassandra's number one position. If there's one thing I didn't like about her, it's her death. Which felt pretty underwhelming, and I wish it was more similar to Hysteria's to make it feel cathartic when Cassandra finally takes her out. The final two are probably the most contentious entries, but since both of them are directly stated to be number one potential, and are comparable to Abyssals when awakened, I will be considering both Miata and Europa as Abyssals. Europa kind of just shows up out of nowhere and just serves as an opponent for Miata. Meaning that this is the fourth time an Abyssal is used only to develop another character. And Europa falls more to the Luciella and Rosemary side rather than the Roxanne side. Her pre-awakening design is pretty forgettable and her awakened one is just decent. I guess I liked her upside down face, but she was literally just thrown into the plot and then just F's off for her fight with Miata. I guess the only other thing of note is that she gave the remaining Claymore something to do in the final battle. Miata's relationship with Claris has been built up since the beginning of the second half and served as our look into the current Claymores. We see the two of them slowly grow more attached to each other, with a sweet dynamic of the cowardly, weak Clarice alongside the unstable but strong Miata. I also really enjoyed seeing Clarice's relationship with her develop from being fearful of her to risking her life just to save her from an opponent that far outclassed her. They take a backseat in the plot for quite a while until the final battle where we finally see the payoff to their relationship. I had a feeling that these two would be doing the Elisa and Beth awakening technique since they were really the only pair in the main cast and I doubt Helen and Denise would have caught it for this. Miata's awakening design is pretty sick, especially when compared to Europa's big football. And I like how Clarice doesn't have as much control over Miata like the previous two twins. Needing help from Galatea and even then struggling. It helps to show that this technique isn't one that any two Claymores can immediately pick up. Clarissa's end was also the most emotional moment in the whole series and perfectly wraps up the character arcs. On a side note, apparently Claymores have memory manipulation as part of their abilities. And that about does it. I don't really have a proper ending to this. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like or dislike it if you didn't. The engagement really helps me out. Also consider sharing it and subscribing for more anime and manga content, which includes more Claymore content, such as a dedicated video on a certain Beyond the Visual character. This is Nanto Gias, signing out.